Ramesh Sharma and Aprijit Ramnath in conversation on science, technology, and the making of modern India. So please give a, a round of uh, applause for them uh, and welcome them on stage. Hello? Yeah. Um, thank you all for being here. Good afternoon um, and welcome to this session. I know we've already paid respects to um, our friend and colleague, Professor Patrick French, but I just want to mention him again uh, because I think he would have been really delighted to see uh, this festival. So um, we, we have him in mind as we, um, as we go forward. We've been talking uh, today about so many different uh, aspects of history, but one theme that has kind of uh, come out repeatedly, uh, especially in the first two panels that I uh, had the privilege of watching, uh, was the concept of modernity and the modern, right? We talked about the modern state uh, and its requirements, the, the kinds of uh, ge you know, the geological survey, the trigonometrical survey, the imperatives of colonial rule. Um, the idea of modernity is strongly associated with and intertwined with uh, these other terms, science and technology. And science and technology have now become such ubiquitous terms for us that we don't stop to think what they mean or where they came from. But they have a long and very particular history. Um, and they can mean different things in different contexts. Uh, the word scientist itself is less than 200 years old. People before that were not called scientists, they were natural philosophers. Um, does that matter? Does that distinction matter? We'll, we'll see, about, we'll see uh, uh, some of those themes as we go along. Um, technology, for instance. If you think about the word technology for a moment, uh, it's a very strange word, right? Um, if you think by analogy with a word like biology, the word biology is the study of living organisms, whereas, and technology, therefore, uh, by strict analogy, would be the study of certain kinds of systems, but we also use the same word for the things that we are studying, right? We say this is a piece of technology. Um, so there's a lot of slippage, uh, and a lot of this is political. It involves the kinds of uh, meanings we want to imbue these terms with, um, and they are really central to uh, many of the debates and decisions that have gone into the making of our present world, and particularly our subcontinent and our nation. Uh, so it's uh, my privilege to be talking to uh, two really, um, uh, two really impressive writers. Um, <coughs> my name is Aprajit Ramnath. I teach here at Ahmedabad University. Uh, to my left is Dr. Dinesh Sharma, uh, who prefers to be known as Dr. Dinesh C. Sharma because um, he has uh, a namesake well known in another field. Um, Dinesh C. Sharma is an award-winning journalist. Um, of many, many years standing, but I know him as um, a great writer on books of history. Um, one of his best known books uh, came out with MIT Press called, and it's called The Outsourcer and it's a definitive history of the Indian IT industry. Uh, his most recent book is called um, Indian Innovation, Not Jugaad. Um, and I think that tells a good uh, portion of the story, but I, I, I'm looking forward to uh, more details uh, from Dinesh. Um, Dinesh has uh, worked on a, a mind-boggling array of uh, subjects, both as a reporter and recently as a writer of books. He's now currently working on uh, a third book, uh, which is on the making of modern Hyderabad, which is where he comes from originally. Uh, to my right is Professor John Matthew. Um, John Matthew is uh, Associate Professor at Kriya University. 
where uh, he chairs the Division of Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, he is that rare species, and I use the word species uh, advisedly because uh, he is a PhD in uh, ecology. He studied, has degrees in zoology and another PhD from Harvard University in the history of science. Um, so he is, um, uh, and, and you can see that he's got elephants and giraffes on his tie if you zoom in close enough, right? So um, uh, John is also what I consider a kind of renaissance man. He's, uh, he's a musician, he writes plays, um, he, 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 conducts, he conducts choirs, and uh, if uh, time permits, we'll try to bring some of his experiences in those fields uh, into the discussion today. Uh, he is, uh, his, his book is coming out soon. It's called, um, uh, it, the name ex uh, escapes me, uh, To Find a Fauna, to fashion, to fashion a Fauna uh, for British India. And it's a history of natural history uh, in, in India. And he will talk more about what that means. Um, and he's also currently working on, um, he's working on a history or rather histories of um, pandemics like the influenza pandemic and plague in early 20th century India, late 19th century, early 20th century India. All right, so uh, together we're going to explore some themes uh, in the history of science and tech and, um, and then hopefully leave enough time to get a lot of questions from uh, all of you. All right. So uh, may I start with John? Um, John, what does the history of science and tech mean to you and how did you uh, come to this field? Jack, can you hear me? Good. Thank you, good. Um, to start, thank you very much. I appreciate it for that very gracious and kind introduction. And thank you all for being here. And I'd like to thank all the people that thought of this festival in the first place. My congratulations. And hello to dear friends over here that I'm seeing after a good long time. Um, I didn't know that the history of science existed until I got to Harvard University and I found some of my students in biology doing the subject called history and science. And I found myself gravitating to classes in the subject and realizing just how much they spoke to me. And this was really kindled by a love of history in the first place when I was a child and having the great privilege of being able to travel with my, with my father, who was a geneticist in West Asia, North Africa. And it always seemed to me unfortunate that in my undergraduate years in India, I could not read both biology and history. And so when I got the opportunity in the United States to be able to do that, I jumped at the opportunity. And although that meant a considerable increase the number of years that I spent as a student, um, I'm grateful for it. And it also enabled me to do something, which was to look at the subject that I had known in the sciences from the point of view of another lens, and that was history. And, to, and while I'd worked in ecology on a somewhat esoteric and arcane aspect, um, and to give you the name of my previous thesis, it was aphytophagy in the militini, which means feeding on non-plant sources or carnivorous caterpillars, if you will, um, from South Africa and North America. But for my second PhD, I got to come back home to India because I was working on the making of zoology in India under the French and the British, and, and culminating in this really extraordinary series called The Fauna of British India, which is 82, 81 and a half volumes long and constructed over 60 years. Now the history of science itself was interesting and you raised um, attention to this just looking at the words scientia, meaning knowledge of decline, techni. And what does that mean from the point of view of understanding something from a theoretical perspective versus praxis? And what did it mean to have those that thought, those that conceived, versus those that did? And the latter very often seen as subordinated to the former. 
right? And how do these, in some sense, come together, and when? And what does that have to do with how we understand knowledge now? There was a man called Henry Bigelow, who was a physician um, at the Harvard Medical School, had this very interesting definition of technology, which was the application of the sciences to the useful arts. And there's a deep sense of understanding of what craft means, and this is mid-century of the 19th, right? So, yeah, let me leave it at that. Um, that's fascinating because uh, that definition also uh, presumes what we call the linear model, right? Which is that science comes first, and technology comes as an application of science, whereas one of the many interesting things that historians of science have now argued is that that's not always the case. Sometimes technology comes before the science that's associated Absolutely. with it, and that's something perhaps we can talk, uh, talk about as we go along. Uh, Dinesh, could you uh, tell us what does the history of science mean to you, and how did you come to it? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Thanks for having me, and must congratulate the organizers for conceiving this kind of a forum where people from different disciplines could come really and talk about their work and new ideas can be generated as it was mentioned in the morning that maybe new books will come out of the discussions and the conversations which happen today, so which is a great thing. No, I mean, unlike John, I don't come from an academic world. I left my academy when I joined journalism, which I'm a trained journalist. And of course, PhD, I the degree I got just two years back at the age of 60, so I can't be in the running for a second PhD. <laughs> so it will take another 20 years, so to say. So I've been uh, a journalist for almost 40 years now, and it so happened that I got into science reporting from day one. And that was a period, and we always say that when you are doing your work, you feel that it's a happening period. But Indeed, for science and technology, I think the period of 80s and 90s, in my opinion, was something, it was a, a phase where, you know, which came after the initial period of nation building and the science, sort of a churn which was happening that people started questioning what is science and technology, has it really lived up to the dreams of what Nehru thought and the big nation building was happening and some sort of a change was happening. So at that point, I started writing about science and technology and covering more intensely the post-liberalization phase in the 90s. And it so happened that, you know, as a journalist, I had a good fortune to interact with many policymakers at different points of time, DGs of CSIR, INSA presidents, and almost every day when I was in Bangalore, I used to go to Indian Institute of Science. And doing science reporting in an age when internet didn't exist was an experience. I mean, I don't know if people how many people sitting in this room can uh, you know, connect with that? Because uh, today, all the journals are available on, uh, on your laptop or on your phone. But at a time when we had to really wait for the print editions to come, and we as a journalist would go to the lib libraries to look at the journals to CSI library or to ISD library, and do cold calling from department to department that, do you have something to tell us? So that's how the news gathering happened. So, that really gave us, uh, gave me a kind of uh, an experience to interact face to face with scientists. Today, even if, if I were to do a story sitting in here, I don't need to interact with scientists or visit the lab. I can just do that over, you know, talk to them or email. And so that, I think that really helped me to gain a deeper understanding of how science works and how uh, science is done. I mean, when you go to a lab and Professor Narsimhan, uh, Rodham Narsimhan showed me the windmill. I, that image is still there that how a windmill, a wind, a wind tunnel works, you know, when the, they were testing the first satellites of uh, PSLV and ASLV were being tested in that wind tunnel, which was there at IIC. So all those things were back of the mind. And when you sort of mature in your profession, you think, yeah, there is a bigger story to tell. So that's how I got interested in writing on science and technology, especially post. 47 and the New India Foundation Fellowship kind of uh, acted as a catalyst and that's how the IT book was done and then I went to the Arctic again looking at how science is done in an area like that so then I wrote a travelogue on that I stayed on an icebreaker for 15 days so I think it's important as a journalist to not only absorb not only to report I mean today um, we can have another session on how journalism is done but yeah you learn those things, and some of those techniques I've tried to apply in and tried to apply in my work and uh, digging out information on 
science and technology history, so that's how I got interested. So that's in brief my journey. And I feel that looking at history of science is very critical, not only in today's age, but what are the processes? I mean, we know that, okay, certain technology, the vaccine has come out or some new development has taken place, but what are the processes of that? And science always works in a social, political, and cultural context. And those are the elements which get missed out when scientists talk about science. So I think it's the, it's the job of uh, historians of science to talk about all other factors. So that's what uh, uh, you know, sounds fascinating to me. Thank you so much, uh, Dinesh. I mean, that, that's such an important point, the fact that science and technology are uh, socially uh, grounded. Right? They're, 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 they occur in a social context. Uh, they're not some sort of um, abstract, um, completely objective, free of uh, human uh, interaction, um, a kind of superior logic that looks down on the world, although that is the objective. Right? The objective is to be objective. Uh, but we know that um, in, um, uh, in, in practice, um, if you want to understand a particular theory, if you want to understand a particular uh, a paradigm of doing science, you need to know who are the people who are involved in it, where are they coming from, what is the political moment in which they are functioning, uh, and so on. And uh, that, that brings me to John, uh, your, to your work on, um, on natural history, uh, because natural history as a discipline, it seems to me, um, is, is very much sort of tied in with, um, in it, at least in some context, with the colonial uh, endeavor. Um, and that may not be the case everywhere, but certainly in the kinds of figures that you have spoken about in India, uh, the making of the discipline of natural history um, is, it seems to be quite closely tied in with the colonial savants, so to speak, right? So if you could tell us a little bit about what is this word natural history, because we don't hear it so much now unless we're talking about certain museums, um, and where does the concept come from and how is it or to what extent is it linked to the, that colonial moment uh, in, in, in world history? Um, thank you, Prajit. Um, there's certainly a great deal of attention paid to museums, for example, of natural history that are coterminous with the, with the colonial moment, but natural history itself predates it by a good long period, and one can consider it even along lines of Aristotle. You know, when, you're, when he's making distinctions between plants and animals to start with, and his student, Theophrastus, will go on to name herbs, shrubs, and trees, and it's, and, um, it's, it's significant that the terms, and you've raised already natural philosophy, which will then go on to govern the physical sciences in many ways and natural history, will be used well before this period. And natural history becomes particularly important from a utilitarian perspective. And that's because your even words like zoology and botany that we might consider today um, are very connected with medicine. What animal products can be used to help, or what plant products. And, you, and so travels in many ways very often tied in with trade and exploration. The colonial moment will come later, piggybacking on the opportunity to see in the first place, um, will result in a number of descriptions that frankly board upon, border up and verge upon the fantastical. You've got chimeras and you've got goat's heads coming out of lions' bodies and the like, because people haven't seen, but they're making it to, to books on natural history, in, especially during the Renaissance, right? And um, what happens, however, is that printing and the, the technology of printing will allow for the mass dissemination of such books, typically under patronage, right? But where the colonial moment comes in is where you can actually take objects back. And when you do that, then it means that you can also largely get rid of the fantastical because you can see the animal. You can bring it back or the plant as the case may be. Um, 
Q, if you consider it, becomes essentially the center of this huge network of colonial gardens, the likes of which, can, other, the likes of others of which can be found in places like St. Vincent, uh, pont in, in Mauritius. So Maurice. just for the audience, you're referring to the Royal Botanical the Garden. Garden at Kew, yes, in, yes, thank you. Yeah. And also the Calcutta Botanical Garden, the like. Um, but what's significant is that you're using in France, and France really is the heart of this, and part of my work uh, taught me this, and that was that while the British seem to be in India way ahead of the French, and we've seen that even with what um, Chin Mei had to say earlier when he was showing you the maps, and, and the French are re reduced to little redoubts. From, the point, from an intellectual perspective, the French are way ahead for a good long time, and that's largely because of a major centralized perspective. And so it is in uh, the major journals that come out of the Academy de Sciences, the, uh, the Science Academy, that you will have the word l'histoire naturelle or, you know, or natural history up to 1816 being used in that term. And then from 1817, you will find it being broken down into, you will say, zoology, botany, mineralogy, geology. And, and the French are really doing this. And you're having departments of zoology, for example, while Oxford and Cambridge don't have them. In fact, the first place that has a department of zoology anywhere in the United Kingdom is what is now UCL, or University College London, then part of the University of London, which is in 1827 under Robert Grant, who was himself a teacher of Charles Darwin. So it's interesting that that happens. So you can see that while it may appear that this is the case, it's actually antedates it. Uh, excellent. And um, one of the things that, uh, uh, that you, know, you bring out uh, in, in uh, one of your articles that you uh, have co-written with the historian Fatih Fan about the differences between how um, natural history develops as a discipline in, uh, in China and in India, roughly in the late 19th, early 20th century, um, is you, you take us into this debate, which is, uh, which is kind of, you know, one encounters so often in the history of science, uh, but which might be uh, of interest to talk uh, about in, in, uh, in lay terms, uh, which is this question of where does science come from? Uh, how does it move? Um, okay, and, and there's this famous or infamous theory of George Basala who talks about the diffusion of modern science from the West. And typically, if we ask uh, someone, you know, what is the starting point of modern science, we point to something called the scientific revolution, which happened in Europe and then sort of moves with colonialism and other things to other places. And there have been lots of new ways to contest that simplistic. Uh, uh, narrative, right? The, the idea of circulation or the idea of contact zones, etc. Uh, so can you tell us briefly, uh, as opposed to something like looking at Newton and physics and, uh, and chemistry and disciplines like that, looking at natural history, uh, is it fair to say that it gives us a way to, uh, uh, to talk about the way in which this thing called science is constructed by people from across the world rather than in one place in the metropole and then transferred to colonial locations. I'm actually reminded, thank you, Prashita, I'm, remi I'm reminded of what Amitabh Ghosh very mischievously tries to do in the Calcutta chromosome, right, where he says that, and you've got um, Ronald Ross, right, who is, is really uh, believed to be the person who shows what the vector for malaria is, but what Ghosh is doing in his book is saying that there are locals who know the story all the way and Ross is verging on being a bumbling idiot and frankly what they're doing is helping to root him to come to the other end. It's just that what he will see as a major point of recognition doesn't really matter to them and I think that's an important point to make. The fact of credentializing Right? What does it mean to do that? And even look at, the, at, at contemporary science right now. Who gets somewhere first? Who does this? Right? And so this becomes an important question. Um, 
the, the dice are loaded the minute you speak about a particular trajectory of science. We talk, I mean, the very fact that William Hill comes up in 1842 with the word scientist. And then what you're saying, well, this is its root. First of all, in the 19th century, it's going to be largely French and German, which is in some sense supplanting the Latin that you would have had in the 17th and 18th centuries. Then you're moving slowly to other subjects. The question is, which are the countries that are doing it? And moving to England, those are, again, the dominant colonial powers. It's not like you're having tons of science being done in Portuguese, right? Um, what's interesting, however, the only contrast to this is that it's happening in German, while Germany is not a major colonial power. And that's an interesting point uh, to be made. But um, otherwise, yes, Dutch is happening. And the Dutch are even writing in French, right? So you're seeing that moment. So if you have constructs that, that appear accordingly, and you have a colonial moment, there's going to be a great deal of elision of other forms of knowledge. And much of that is because of the intractability of the scientific project, which says, produce your means. These are our standards of reference. What are yours? Right? And um, the same thing can be said for economic theory, right? And you can say, what is, what's going on? What, how do you do this? And think about the fact that when you speak about George Basala and the three-step model, and by the way, this three-step model, uh, very quickly, is when, you, when a colonial power comes to a place that, and, and well, a colonizer, et cetera, essentially. So the term would be the metropole, say, for example, England and the colonial place, the colonized place, be it South Africa or India or the like. The first point is that there is a non-scientific phase. The suggestion that there may be knowledge in a place, it's just not, com it doesn't comport itself along lines that are recognizable to say Paris or London or Amsterdam. So you can immediately see where they're waiting. Second, there is a colonial scientific phase which is largely seen as derivative. For instance, if you have the Asiatic Society of Bengal, it is based largely upon the Royal Society in London, right? So this is, and that is, and, and that's quote. The third is an independent phase in the full flush of decolonization. You say, well, now there's an assertion of who we are, but this is the three-step model. And it is based itself on a five-step economic model by a person called Walt Whitman Rostow. Uh, uh, and Rostow. And so you can see that immediate connection. This is, and these papers are appearing also at a moment of decolonization of the world. This is happening, I mean, uh, Basala's writing in the 60s, right? And, and uh, to what you allude will happen later. Said will write in 1977, 70, you get Orientalism, which is looking back from in the early 80s, you will have the subaltern studies movement, again, the view from below. And it's important to see what waves are happening when. It also helps us to look at periods. And, look, and when you speak about constructions, this is huge, the whole notion of what is social construction at a moment. And so both history and science are not immune to these particular trends. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, John. Um, Dinesh, I wanted to ask you um, a little bit about, um, you know, just carrying on from this, this idea of um, science being seen as a, as a foreign import. Um, there's been a great deal of work on, uh, you know, the, the centrality given to the idea of science in the nation building moments of the 40s and 50s. Um, and so on. And you talk a great deal about this in your, uh, in your book, uh, because when you talk about something like, I mean, today we think of uh, our, ourselves as living in a, in a globalized world. You know, Thomas Friedman claimed the world is flat 20 years ago when he went to Bangalore. Uh, and you, you make the point that this modern uh, IT-enabled, IT-powered sort of superpower that we aspire to be uh, had its roots in very, uh, um, humble and not very shiny looking technology from the 1950s. Um, so what was going on at that time in terms of the imagination of uh, the intelligentsia, the leaders at that time, 
What did they think was the role of science in, 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 a, in a young nation? I'll answer that, but just one line I'll add on Ronald Ross since you mentioned, and I'm looking at his work because the discovery was made in Hyderabad. So he used the Hyderabad patients and the mosquitoes, but somehow he never acknowledged that in his biography. None of his biographies do acknowledge that because he had a different view of looking at the natives, so to say. So he didn't do that. But other contribution came from Edward Lorry, who was also his contemporary in terms of uh, setting up the Hyderabad Commission, the Chloroform Commission. So that, I think that had more impact on the local scientific community, training people, so in building their skills, so to say, doing large uh, uh, studies with uh, animals. That was the largest, I believe, at that time in the world. So using 450 animals you know, to conduct the studies to see whether chloroform is effective or not. Uh, at the end, scientifically, it was, he was proved wrong, but those skills remain. So that's uh, Laurie and uh, Ross study. But yeah, coming to what Aparajit, you asked, yes, the, I mean, if you really look at the uh, science and technology tra trajectory of modern India, it really began in the 30s with the National Planning Committee, you know, and that was a conscious decision at the political level by the Congress party to have, uh, to recognize the role of science and technology in industrialization, in reconstruction, whenever India became free. And but there was an opportunity in the provincial governments which were, which were formed, so they wanted to influence those policies. And that was the first time when, under NPC, it was not uh, the scientific research for the sake of discoveries, but scientific research for the sake of nation building. So therefore, industrialists were involved, business people were involved, and scientists were involved, engineers were involved, Professor I mean, Visheshwaraya was there, and a whole lot of people were there. So the churn really starts, thinking really starts in the, with NPC, which ultimately became the National Planning Commission. Initial days, uh, it was known as NPC, the same acronym remained, the National Planning Commission, then National was dropped, so it became Planning Commission. So, that was a political recognition of uh, looking at science and technology as an essential input in national development and also as a means to overcome the lack of resources. Um, that was a foresight and they were really looking at this. NPC had some 38 committees on fuels, on transport, on health and practically everything. So the blueprint for a modern India was really laid at that time. Maybe a lot of those things didn't were not implemented or not were not implementable after 1947 but those were the ideas which remained in in the uh, in the path that followed in the sense of building new institutions because if you look at uh, india in 1947 i mean we have been discussing a lot about colonialization and you know that period what was it we had a literacy rate of 15% i mean the Agriculture system was 500 years old. The agri agricultural practices, you know, uh, there were famines and people were dying. There was 40s, we had those great famines. And there were political reasons also, as we know, for that. And the health system was in a bad shape because we did have uh, uh, institutional structures in terms of, uh, uh, say, vaccine units, but they were not really the best you know, in the world. We had a structure of CSIR, the BSIR, but it just had four labs and a a budget of only a few lakhs. So what was, uh, and suddenly we had a task of building a new nation, you know, and they were competing in So, so the, uh, it, it was a, it kind of a, a forceful way of doing things in different ways, you know. You had uh, one dozen universities, so do you create new universities or do you create new kind of institutions? You know, like that's how the whole idea of IIT, IIM, the National Institute of Design, do you want to reform the university system or add new departments or have new kind of engineering colleges? We had engineering colleges which turned up engineers only for the railways and PWD. So you couldn't have reformed that. So, and to overcome the resource crunch, you had to think of new ways of foreign collaboration, I mean, getting the faculty from abroad and things like that. And that's how the, and uh, specifically coming to the IT or so to say computer development, it was not even uh, a word then, the IT didn't exist. It was a kind of a technology that was, uh, I mean, the first reference I saw when I was looking at some of the document that 
PC Mahalanob has used uh, human computers. So I was wondering, what is human computer? So there were people employed to do computing, you know? So the humans were really the computers. So then he went into data processing, and that really became a part of uh, doing major science. You know, if you wanted to do a national census, how do you do? You need data processing machines. You need uh, that capability. If you want to develop new reactors, which Baba wanted to, you needed that electronics to go into that. So that was the beginning point of uh, technology. And of course, institution building happened in other ways. Yeah. Well, could you tell us a couple of institutions or, um, or uh, individuals that you think were key in setting the foundation for what later became the, the computer revolution in India? No, of course. The, I mean, there were two streams. One was Mahala Nobis wanted the data processing system for national census, and then he got into planning. And Baba wanted it work for the nuclear reactor. So they were the key kind of, uh, there were two groups working in parallel developing computers because computing was seen as a, as, as a strategic uh, technology, so to say. It was not available off the shelf. Computers were, had to be custom built and you had to write programs for them. So it was a completely different, the first generation, second generation computer. So they needed to develop that capacity. So how do you do? I mean, there were no engineering colleges which taught computer science. The, the discipline didn't exist, even in, uh, very many other universities in the US. It was part of the electrical and uh, electronics uh, engineering, so to say. Electronics came much later. It was part of, uh, you would know because you had done the professions. Uh, so it didn't develop the computer engineering as a profession, didn't develop at that time. So you needed to get the skills. So we got uh, Baba, I mean, uh, had uh, this advantage of this Tata Fellowship, people were being sent. I mean, we didn't have post-graduation studies in any of the engineering studies, so people had to be sent. So we, we did it the hard way, so to say. And then those skills got transferred commercially in the 60s. If you see, look at it, uh, the formation of uh, Electronics Corporation of India Limited. As a child, I used to wonder that why is uh, in Hyderabad ECIL is part of Department of Atomic Energy? It's nothing to do with that. but. The, the, they wanted the electronics for nuclear uh, reactors, so they needed a system which could be built, and then those uh, skills uh, started serving other uh, sectors. So that's how the uh, skills developed. And the first set of startups, when it happened in the policies in the 1970s, they all came out of these institutes. You know, I mean that's what we don't recognize. The I mean people don't like to talk about the role of state in when we are talking of today liberalization, but that was a critical role, you know, which CMC, the Computer Maintenance Corporation, ECIL played, and the first set of Indian startups, the people so who made that could came I just, out of Could that, I just yeah. jump in there? Because in the morning, there was a lot of very interesting talk about counterfactuals, right? And one of the counterfactuals which we always we think about is, you know, people say, oh, liberalization happened uh, 30 years too late. We should have done it much earlier. So had that happened in the 1950s or 60s, what do you think would have been the consequence for development of uh, uh, computers and IT in India? Do you think it would have been faster? Do you think it would have Absolutely been overrun? Absolutely not. Because uh, the whole Bombay plan, where you talk of a mixed economy, was propelled by the Indian capitalists. No? It was the, they wanted the state's role. So this whole misnomer that you know public sector was suppressed and they didn't have a role is a kind of uh, misplaced. You know? They wanted the state's role to be led, you know. Only certain sectors were left because Indian uh, businesses were not ready to take up that technology and nor were the political economy. If you look at when the 60s, when American companies were going for cheap labor to Taiwan and Korea and, you know, Singapore, they did come to India. But our DGTD had a, you know, production kind of a, a cap. You know, you cannot produce more than uh, thousand, you know, uh, components, whereas uh, uh, these companies wanted to do it millions because they wanted to really save the cost. So when the first wave of outsourcing in, in the manufacturing moved in the 60s, our policies didn't allow because you look at the decade of 60s, we had two wars, we had three prime ministers changing, we had huge political instability, and in that, if you, that environment, do you allow uh, that kind of a thing? So, yeah, maybe. Today we can say that if we could have done that, India would have been the manufacturing hub of the world in the 60s and 70s. But yeah, it was politically and socially, and it was not possible. And people were not ready. The Electronics Committee, headed by Baba, did give out a report which listed what all needs to be done. But were we ready to do that at that time? No.
So, <laughs> so, so, so I want to, um, uh, since we're kind of getting out of time, I want to uh, get you to talk a little bit about your, your latest book, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's 100, you talk about 100 innovations that characterize uh, modern India, and especially post-independence India. Um, and of course, the computer revolution is one of them, the green revolution is part of it, but you also talk about many other things which people don't normally think about when you use the word innovation, right? Uh, so you have a very interesting and capacious definition of the word in innovation as it relates to the building of a modern nation. So could you talk to us a little bit about yeah. uh, what are some of the different types of innovations you cover in your book? And also, why is, what do you have against Jugaad? No. <laughs> No, Jugaad, of course, uh, one can talk about it because I know a whole lot of work has been done in Ahmedabad. Professor Basanti is there, Dr. Uh, Professor Anil Gupta has worked on grassroots innovation. But what I had in mind was that I mentioned about the situation in 1947, how did the nation start at that time? And uh, what are the things which we did right in different sectors that changed the situation? For example, we were importing drugs. I mean, Indian companies were only manufacturing uh, tinctures and cough syrups and uh, pain lotions. I mean, and everything was being imported and uh, drugs were the costliest, Indian drugs were the costliest in, in the world. And today they are among the cheapest. So how did that change? Did it, did it happen because of technology? Did it happen because of uh, regulatory system? Or did it happen because of entrepreneurship? But actually, if you look at it, it happened because of a creative policy the political decision to change the patent law. It took 20 years, and the law changed in 1947 to, I'm uh, sorry, 1971 to, from the products to processes, because if you have a product patent, a company can uh, uh, get a patent for brand name, and that's how multinationals were reaping benefits. So when it changed to process patents, you can have a new process for an existing product and sell it in the Indian market. So, it was a creative policy, and 20 years India discussed that. It's not as if all of a sudden, 69, it was decided in 71, it happened. There's a long process of that that happened. But that policy really changed. I mean, that propelled Indian labs to think of what we call today reverse engineering, you know, developing new processes for existing drugs. That propelled Indian companies to go into local manufacturing. Seven, I mean, Renback Seas and the Siplas and they all started real manufacturing of the drugs in 1971, in the 70s, with the help of CSR labs at like NCL or RRL Hyderabad. So it was a creative policy, I mean, which we tend to forget. So that's one of the innovations I would say I have included. So basically the idea here was to include uh, transformative ideas, you can say, and not look, at techno uh, not look at innovation only as a technological innovation. I mean, today the, there are two, three broad uh, strands uh, how people look at innovation. One is the Silicon Valley definition is everything technology-led, you know. We lead the technology revolution, uh, the technological innovation. Other one is which uh, management institutes and Professor Basant has also worked on that, the firm-level innovation. How do companies innovate to remain competitive or, you know, ahead of... Uh, others and maximize their profit. So companies change their processes, practices, and the way they, they do things by innovating at the floor level at, in how they sell the products. And third way, of course, is uh, again made famous by management gurus is this Jugaad idea. I mean, Jugaad has been much abused. I don't need to talk more because uh, uh, it's a kind of a shortcut to of course, it emanates from a mindset of, say, lack of resources. You know, we, we don't have something, how do you overcome that problem? So it emanates from that. But if it becomes a way of life, if it, I mean, today in social media, you find so many people celebrating uh, Jugaad, okay, this guy has done this thing, you know, he's running something in this farm. So all those are shortcuts, and they're not sustainable. They're, so that's what I'm saying. Ki, if you really want to recognize Indian innovation, look at the ideas. It could be a creative policy. It could be, as I mentioned, about the Patents Act. It could be something like the Software Technology Park Scheme. It could be even, uh, say, uh, National Family Planning Program. I mean, if you look at it, it's a government program. But how was it implemented? That was the first program that was branded. It had a logo. It had a slogan. And that was the first time in India somebody thought, OK, a government program needs to be marketed as a, as a brand. I mean, today every, everything is branded. You know, you have Ujala to 
everything is Sri Nidhi and so many hundreds of schemes, everything is branded, but that was the first program that was branded. And there are so many micro innovations happened in the family planning program. The whole concept of moving birth control from a clinic to a community, that was the uh, tremendous idea. I mean, till the 60s, the only way you could think of birth control was to go marry stops or there were several other, other private clinics, you know, which had to, uh, which people the, had to go. And in the initial decades, uh, uh, Rajkumari Amrit Kaur, she was a Gandhian, so she promoted this uh, uh, beads method, you know, I mean, that she even convinced WHO to adopt that as a technique. So that the whole concept of, you know, moving to the community, social marketing of the uh, birth control device, those were the innovative ideas in family planning program. So even government schemes can be innovative. I mean, there are a number of examples which I have given in my book. Are, and then there were several technological innovations. I'm not saying that everything is only policy level. For example, if you have a, uh, say, I don't know how many of uh, uh, people in this row, I mean, this room at the back would know something called Nutan Stowe. Anybody knows? Yeah. Uh, people below 50, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So as a child, I used that. So that image was there in my mind that, you know, that was a new kind of a stove which gave blue flame and, you know, it kind of replaced the pump stove, you know. So something I have, uh, people who have, as a person uh, who has grown up in the 60s and 70s, so those ideas also were at the back of mind. I mean, you will not find Newton's stove as an innovative idea in any references. In fact, the people who did, even they have forgotten the Indian Institute of Petroleum in Dehradun and Indian Oil Corporation R&D. I asked for materials, they had none. Uh, what, who were the people who developed and things like that. So some uh, things are there in the public imagination. So it was in response to the oil shock. The Newton was developed as a, a response to, because uh, we were spending so much of money on importing kerosene. So the innovation system did that, you know, came up with a solution. Then, of course, we had the smokeless chula developed by Professor Amulya Kumar Reddy at uh, Indian Institute of Science. So th th those were the kind of ideas which are in response to societal needs or the uh, changing policy environment or the you know, external factors. So some of those uh, ideas I've tried to put in, which, will, which kind of are forgotten in the mainstream uh, making of modern India, so to say. Sure. Um, that's fascinating. And I'm going to come uh, to something in a bit, to, to something very interesting in your, in your book, which is that it recognizes innovations which are not necessarily scientific and techn technological innovations, right? Although you're broadly writing on the history of science, uh, you're looking at uh, innovations in, 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 in policy, innovations in the legal framework, uh, innovations in environmental movements and other things. And there are some contradictions in the choices of innovations that you have chosen to chronicle, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and, and I'm sure you have a design for that. Uh, John, I wanted to ask you, um, since we're talking about uh, we had this conversation about what we call presentism in history and the, the idea that we are looking at history from the lens of the present. And sometimes it's a legitimate thing to do, to look for lessons or to look for uh, things that we can, uh, uh, we can pick up. Um, given that we've just been through this worldwide uh, pandemic um, of COVID-19, um, there, were there any echoes from your work on, on the plague and uh, flu um, epidemics of the early 20th century in India, uh, was there anything, any sort of, to put it crudely, lessons that could be learned, or any patterns that you saw repeating, um, or any kind of other uh, correspondence that you saw between these events? It was really interesting that, I mean, in, when you look at history books, that what was the greatest killer in India at its moment in time didn't even occasion a peep. I didn't know about the great influenza, the Spanish flu, until I came across a book by Michael Davis called Late Victorian Holocaust, and it mentions it over there. And I said, why didn't I know about this? And I encountered this in the United States. So when I was working in Isa Pune, I took leave of the occasion to go to the Maharashtra State Archives and then comb through this. and and. So when COVID hit, I'd already been working these archives for 
three or four years and I had, and, and it was staggering, right? And what is interesting about this? First of all, let's look at these in their, in their own right. And Chinmay Thumbe is here and has written The Age of Pandemics. At some point, I need to ask you whether that was Hobbes Bohemian in trying to do The Age of Reason, The Age of Capital, and then move on to The Age of Pandemics, but yeah. Um, but there were other books, I mean, and I think you were in Jaipur at some point with Laura, right, with Laura Spinney. Did you ever get to talk with her? And so, and she had written this book called Pale Rider, and uh, which, which gained a lot of attention in its time before that. There was John Barry writing uh, uh, the book on the Great Flu, but it wasn't hitting our imaginary. And that, what was interesting is the play got a lot more attention. When the play gets attention, you've got it in 1895, 96 when it really hits, and then partly because there's an assassination in it, a person, the Chafeka brothers uh, assassinate Walter Rand and a person called Lieutenant Ayast um, in Pune, and there is a monument to them still. And this is actually interesting, because when I went to the Bharat Darshan once for um, Independence Day back in 2015, they, this becomes one of these spots. And you say, well, yes, it's an assassination. Is it a nationalistic moment? But who was it that they shot? They shot the plague commissioner. It wasn't that they were shooting a governor general or a viceroy or some other administrator. And what does this mean? How do we sieve this in some sense? And I say this from the point of view of presentism. Right? Because this happens in the here and now. We've taken this trip, and you're looking back, you're reflecting on time and saying, well, this happened, right? And, uh, and I draw this to your attention. Literature talks about it as a wonderful set of books by uh, two doctors, Ishrit Saeed and Kalpana Swaminathan, who write under the name Kalpish Ratna. And it's called The Quarantine Papers in Room 000. And what they do is they talk about this event but they do something really interesting. They go directly to the archives, and, they, and in those pages will be found, found, we found a direct facsimile, pretty much, of what exists in the archives, which is a great way of looking at historical fiction. And so if we're responding to the whole idea of literature and history, they're doing a great job in that particular regard, right? But here's what's really fascinating. This is happening, right? I mean, it goes on technically for about 25 years, but the, but the high noon will be in many ways in that 1896 to 1900, 1902, where people like Waldemar Hafkin, Alexander Yersin, they will all get involved. And then it sort of lasts in a more endemic sense. And then you have in twice, in 1918, you've got a less severe incidence in the um, mid-year of... 1918, and by the time you come to November, it's really hitting India, right? And especially the West, coming through Bombay, sweeping up Pune, going up towards the north, uh, and going with troops. So if there's any particular connections to be made, I will ask you to consider this. We've gone through two and maybe more difficult, really difficult years. But imagine going through this and also having a major international conflict. Imagine if we were at war. And what, and if we've got some level, and I don't even use you know, the word empathy, we've got some level of understanding, some measure of what it might have been like. Now think about compounding that with a situation where belligerent nations are taking each other on. And that's what happens in the Spanish flu or the great influenza, because it's hitting before you have the armistice of November the 11th, right? And that's huge. What are things that we learned? Well, we, st we still invoked the Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897. Right? And, it's a, and, and that's what you're having, right? What else did you do? I mean, you, you're looking at things like chloroquine and the like you're going to drugs that you use not for a virus, but from a microparasite that is, that is a, invoked in malaria, right? Not even a bacterium, right? And so, and then the United States comes to bear upon India to say, can we send more of this? And, and that's what's happening. Because we are... We're casting around, right? What's another thing that happens? During the plague, you have much of the city of Bombay fleeing. 
Think about what happens in the first wave of COVID-19 when you have all of your guest workers trying to leave cities and just trying to get home. And there are these heart-rending pictures of people being placed in trucks and being sent back. I know this. We saw it. We were trying to help people with food. I'm sure many people here did the same. So, so on the one hand, there was a great deal of hubris. If you look at Netflix pictures about, on coronavirus, we say, we should be able to fix this fairly soon. Uh, episode one. Episode three, how do we deal with mental health issues? And it seems like there's a great deal of humility that's happened between episode one and episode three. Right? So you've got these two. One, it seems to be this major moment of the now, we're bullish about things. And the other one, you're resorting to what's happening in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And that's paradoxical. Something which happened at the end of 20th century, the Surat plague. Well, That's you, uh, completely out century, of yes. the public memory. Uh, but, so. no, but what's interesting over there is that it got fairly contained. A lot more was about the scare, right? If you look at the actual numbers, I think the great fear over there was that it was deemed to be the pneumonic plague, which is even more frightening than the bubonic in this particular regard. But yes. Sure. Um, so I want to leave some time for audience questions, but I have a couple of questions uh, more for the panelists. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll start with you, John. Um, John, we, uh, I know that you have um, experimented with different forms of, uh, forms of literature and art um, as a vehicle to explore ideas in the history of science. You wrote a novel once uh, about uh, uh, surrounding the ideas of, uh, uh, of evolution. Um, you have recently written a play, uh, which you staged, a musical, which you staged with your students. Um, uh, and uh, you also, um, um, uh, you've also um, uh, conducted a choir, um, with, and, and you use all of these different media to explore certain ideas in history, in the history of science. Uh, so how does one, what do you gain from these different approaches? If you could make it kind of fairly brief, uh, what does one gain from these different approaches beyond the standard archival research uh, approach which we take in our professional lives, and what are the uh, um, constraints that you as a historian place on yourself in using these art forms in, uh, uh, in relation to history? Uh, thank you, Aprajit. This, is, this matters deeply to me. And one of it, one of the, I mean, what's at the heart of all of this is communication. And I've always believed that Knowledge shouldn't be dry and desiccated. You need to want to indulge. You need to want to love it and share it in any way possible. And so when I, did, when I do my archival research, I must confess that I'm always looking for double duty. Can it also go into the world of the creative? And can you reach people, in, especially those people who won't even touch a paper of yours? You know, because, it's, yeah, because they're going to be put off by the abstract it, itself, let alone anything else. But um, what I found is that it enables you to think in many ways and say, is this possible? Is it plausible? And, and something for which you might get crucified in, uh, in, uh, in academic literature, you may have more possibilities. Could you give, me an, uh, give us an example of that? Um, is it possible, for example, that, um, I mean, it's interesting, this person called Edward Blythe, who was, a, who was a first paid curator or keeper of the Asiatic Society's collections, and he was paid and he came along. And uh, did Calcutta. he? In Calcutta, yes, the Asiatic Society is in Calcutta. And... Um, so one of the questions I asked, and funnily enough, this made it its, its way into a paper later, but I said, um, was, this per, was there a particular person before this who was playing the role of honorary curator who essentially got really vexed by the fact that this chap was coming in and so said, see if I care, and goes off and starts another journal, right? So you're exploring this first of all from the point of view of literature, and then I said, 
maybe there's something to this. And then eventually a paper did come out of it. But, you're, but the fact is you're still exploring this particular idea and that's one of the things that happened. Um, one thing, I mean, there's this one person who, and his name is Brian Hewton Hodgson. And he's this remarkable character. I mean, he's, he is, he's trained by Thomas Malthus, right, in Haleybury College in Hertfordshire, in England, which is training people for the East India Company. Comes to Calcutta and is, I mean, he's topped his class in Hindustani and all these things. He's, he's ready, but he falls very ill and, the doc, and his doctor gives him three stark choices. Six feet under, resign the service, or get a hill appointment. So he chooses the third, goes to Darjeeling, then goes on eventually to Nepal. And they've just had the Treaty of Sigoli because the British have been able to de uh, defeat a rampaging Nepali force under a man called Bhim Santapa. And so that obliges Nepal to have a resident in, in Kathmandu, but then they can, keep, they can have a certain level of autonomy. Um, something along the lines of subsidiary alliance, but you never have what Delazi does later, so Nepal remains independent. Now, Hodgson, who becomes sequentially what? Associate, I mean, uh, assistant resident, postmaster, and real acting resident, and then resident, speaks. Nepali, Newari, Tibetan, uh, studies Buddhist architecture, supports an idea of the Turanian hypothesis, talking about particular origins for in eth ethnography, and writes 127 papers naming new birds and mammals, which is where my work came in, right? Because I said, who is this chap who's writing this? And he writes an idea for a fauna nepalensis, which will be a precursor for the fauna of British India, which I will eventually study. But for me, it was really important to use him in a play, which I did, both in his period in time, because he's also involved with political intrigue all the way through, right? One of these really fascinating people, the likes of whom you don't really encounter today, because people are far too specialized to do this. But, but the other thing is that I also use him as a ghost, which I'm fine doing in a play, who can inform the commerce counselor to the Indian embassy over there, who's fictional, uh, but who's also a bird watcher, about what's going on leading to the regicide in 2001 when King Birendra and Queen Aishwarya get shot by uh, Crown Prince Dipendra. And it also is important to me, and I raise this point to you, for, us, for me to get insight into parts of South Asia that seldom get spoken about, right? Why is it that it's always India and South Asia being spoken about? What about the other countries of our region? And we really need to know more about our neighbors. As I said, why do we know more about uh, Lexington or Madison Avenue in New York than we know about Kathmandu? And, and so, there, so it's through a number of things coming together, but aspects of bird watching, for example, and the naming of birds and taxonomy are really intrinsic to this particular story. And so you get to speak about these things and you manage to sneak in these elements of your research and hopefully they carry the story as well. Absolutely. Um, uh, Chinmay, do we have about 20 minutes left? Okay. Uh, so then my last question uh, would be in continuation with that, Dinesh. Um, a new uh, series is out, uh, Rocket Boys 2. Okay. Uh, and Dinesh has reviewed Rocket Boys 1. Um, so... See, we are living in a, uh, in a time when um, everything that happens in our world is grist to the mill of content creation for OTT platforms, uh, right? So uh, we can see many more such documentaries about science, about uh, various moments, and there's strong tendency to portray them in kind of very uh, sometimes nationalistic or triumphalist uh, terms. Uh, so as someone who deals with the history of these kinds of uh, uh, events and projects, what do you look for in terms of veracity, plausibility? When you see a, a doc, uh, when you see a movie like this, you know it's fictionalized. You accept that, uh, but what are the things that you're looking for in a in a good uh, sort of um, reenactment of that moment? I'm glad you asked that question, and I'm carrying that newspaper. I wanted to show the ad today. It's a good day to talk about it. 
Yeah, I think science communication by all means is a good thing. I believe that. And as John mentioned, there are various ways of expressing science. And one of them is dance your PhDs. One of those competitions is there. So, I mean, so there are newer forms being explored all the time. And films and docudramas are, uh, uh, of course, an old uh, medium, but being exploited to convey ideas in science and technology history. And, but there are problems. Unless we do it properly, people might get a different notion of science. Because everybody is not going to read the books. And these are the uh, kind of uh, products which reach a large number of people. And we are living in a true age of misinformation, disinformation, and fake news. So people are already so much of confused. So if something is presented to you in a way that it is authentic, people may take it seriously. For a whole generation of Indians, the millennials, I mean, 35, below 35 is 60% of our population. So people have not heard, I mean, I've, in 60s and 70s, we used to read a lot about Sarah Bhai and Baba, but today's generation, which is born in the new millennium, have not heard of them. So it is their first introduction. And if we are going to go wrong there, and they are going to carry those impressions all along. Because nobody is reading, picking up Robert Anderson's book and The Atom in the Nation and learn about the Sarabha and uh, Baba. Because there are serious problems with the first series. The first part, I mean, I wrote a long piece about it that it's more of science fiction than science. Because uh, it's very critical to portray, I'm not saying make it a documentary, fictionalize it. But you are playing with characters whose families are still living. Of course, I think we should ask that question to Malika tomorrow, because she has kind of uh, approved the first part. But yeah, Sara Bhai's life was portrayed very sensitively. But Baba's has not been in that sense, if you compare the two characters, in my view. And there are, I mean, it's Baba's work and uh, work of TIFR and the Atomic Energy Vision, well researched and well written about. It's not as if. I, the historic accounts don't exist, but maybe they have tried to ignore. For example, in one sequence, you have C.V. Raman dancing in the marriage of Sarah Bhai and <laughs> making merry with the wine. And you know, I mean, it's a, you're introducing C.V. Raman is the first portrayal of him. I mean, for the first time, I think in any movie, he's appearing. And you see him dancing and having wine. So, and in another scene, you have. Uh, Baba jumping into the Apsara pool, the swimming, the swimming pool reactor. He's literally jumping like a swimming pool to fix a nut bolt thing because uh, Nehru is waiting in the other room to commission it. So these are the kind of things, you know. And then the third and most, uh, I think, uh, uh, regrettable stuff they have done, they have created a caricature for Saha. And they have named it a Muslim character. I mean, which is a very devious way to do that. If they wanted a villain in ba against Baba, somebody who was opposing Baba's plan all the time, which Saha was in some ways. I mean, it's all documented, and there are letters and stuff like that. So, they could, if you could name, if you could name Sara Bhai and Baba, why not name Saha, and why make him a Muslim character? So, those are the real problems. So, I suppose in the second part, I don't know how they are going to deal with it because it's a very potent medium. For example, uh, Hollywood has learned it. A better way. I mean, you can always find faults with them, but something like Hidden Figures, I don't know how many of you have seen that film. It's a classical film where NASA had to recognize, I mean, it was so well researched based on a book, obviously, that the role of black women who played in the making of the first mission to the moon. So that Going NASA back to had your to. your point about human computers. Yeah, like human computers. Yeah. They were the real human computers. And NASA then recognizes after the film is made that, you know, yeah, we missed that out. And then they recognize and they uh, properly place them in the, on a pedestal. So can we make that kind of a thing? Right. So if we are, TIFR is there, they are going to cooperate with you if you go and there's a beautiful archive there. So I think it's a kind, if, if, I mean, if you call it a fiction, that is fine. Rocketry, another movie, it's about... Uh, uh, life of Nambi Narayan. Again, the, all the major characters in that movie are living today. I mean, why not uh, really do a justice to history? It's not a history as if people have disappeared. They are still there. So I think that's a problem. But it's a potent medium, certainly. But there are major issues in my issue. <laughs>
Thank you so much. That was uh, very enlightening. I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, uh, questions and views uh, from the audience, so please feel free to ask the, uh, the speakers. Uh, the gentleman in the hat, please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Somnath Mitra. I'm part of uh, Center for Digital Transformation at IIM Ahmedabad. So I have a question for uh, Mr. Dinesh Sharma. You know, what is the role of Cold War and geopolitics post-liberalization? Because there was an influence of uh, Cold War, USSR. Uh, you know, there was a whole technology transfer which was happening in the various steel plants. I know that. Uh, in railways, I know that. In the ISRO, I know that. So your thoughts on uh, you know, the role of USSR, global geopolitics, and Cold War on the technology transfers that were happening before liberalization. Over to you, sir. No, of course, everything what you mentioned is correct, and everything did have an impact. If you look at the decade of 60s, both USSR and USA were trying to influence India in a major way. So USSR, as a USA, we, with America, we had this Indo-American uh, Kanpur project, out of which was born IIT Kanpur. So that was a major influence. I mean, I mean, people were placed in uh, the faculty was there, and it did help develop an institute. But did it uh, was it done it the right way? We could ask that. It was an American. Uh, kind of engineering system that was brought to here. And at the end of the 10 years, the review committee, which was formed by this uh, MIT consortium, um, uh, MIT-led consortium, which reviewed, which said that we wanted an Indian MIT, not an MIT in India. So that's what they felt at the end of 10 years. So there was a lot of influence, and a lot of US projects came, and uh, the mosquito elimination, there were a lot of controversies also. I mean. Uh, BNHS was involved in a big project. So there were major controversies at that time. And in the 70s, USSR had a, a good role to play the geopolitics, the good relations between India and uh, USSR helped us to uh, move ahead in the uh, 70s and 80s in the space program. So luckily for India, it benefited from the Cold War, I would say, and the Cold War between the two superpowers. And the technology denial, which happened with the supercomputer and the, after the po Pokhran, that really, you know, kind of forced Indians to develop their own stuff. You know, the capabilities, the design capabilities we had to acquire ourselves, we had to develop the material in subcomponents which were denied to us. So that kind of had a positive effect on some of our uh, indigenization and import substitution programs. So that did. Maybe one can argue whether if we had, uh, if we were able to import freely, could we have developed those capabilities? One can always uh, look at that way. So in the 70s and 80s, pre-liberalization days, it did have an impact, and some positive and some negative, I would say. For example, when uh, we were denied the supercomputer, uh, we decided to develop our own. The Param, the CDAC was born out of that. So there were positives of uh, that period. Then, of course, cryogenic crisis happened that, that derailed the program by 10 years, so that was post-liberalization in the 90s, yeah. Thank you. We have a question over here. Uh, my name is Satyji Chakravarti, uh, but before I have a question for Dr. Dinesh uh, C. Sharma. Uh, she has he. But before that, I would like to have a word for, a uh, word of thanks for uh, Dr. John Matthews, and that is to say thank you for making sound everything, uh, for ma making it sound fun and friendly, okay? It was wonderful listening to all of you, including especially you. And the question to Dr. Sharma is uh, thank you for regaling us on the developments of from Newton to the nuclear technology. Uh, and Newton, I remember, the first one, it had a fuel indicator. Kitna level kerosene ka hai, wo bhi ek point ye tha. <coughs> My question is, uh, talking about the family planning program, how do you see India going for, you know where we are, okay, we've almost overtaken China. Now, where do you think India is going uh, to make the program more value and result driven? That's my question. 
I mean, I'd not like to hazard a guess because uh, I know not a political. It's not a yeah. It, it has several dimensions, and I don't think I am an expert in the health policies to comment on that. I may I have some views, but I would not like to. Okay, um, this is the standard response which historians always give, right? <laughs> Don't ask me about the future, ask me about the past. And, and, and I do that too, because we're just not equipped to talk about the future. Um, <clears throat> anybody else? <laughs> no, if, if that were the case, then, then, then we... <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> no, 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 I won't say pass again, no. Um, because then history would be repeating itself, right? Um, yes. Okay, sir, uh, I'm assistant professor at Parul University and uh, during, <laughs> yeah, so during my MPhil and PhD research, uh, in my MPhil I worked on uh, science museums, so my case study is Gujarat Science City. So there I found some posters on the scientists so there are some posters like C. V. Raman, Baba, and all. So, but uh, I did not found any f female scientist photographs and all. So this type of discrimination also uh, <laughs> in our Indian culture and museums also we can see this type of discrimination that you told. Like uh, on the basis of some type of recognition and their caste and status wise, maybe shared this type of discriminations. I also observed and I mentioned in my dissertation and thesis also. So I think you, yeah. can I go ahead? please, please. Uh, you said it very rightly and your observation is very right. So because when this poster was made, people said, yeah, somebody commented on Twitter that it's good that you're going to talk about women also. Yes. Unfortunately, <laughs> Jan couldn't come, so it has become a manel. So we don't have a representation. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, just yeah. to clarify, uh, ja ja Dr. Janvi Falke, Jan Falke, who's uh, director yeah. of the Science yes. Gallery yeah. in uh, Bangalore, could not come because uh, of some pressing uh, last-minute engagement. But we, we really would have enjoyed having her. <laughs> to answer your question, I think it's a very valid point because uh, yeah. uh, there are it so all depends. I mean, it's a... Mm -hmm. It depends on how history is told, how history is written, who is writing the history of science. But of course, of late, some efforts have been made to correct that. There have been some very recent books on women. For example, uh, of course, uh, National Academy, INSA brought out Leela Vati's daughters, and uh, Bangalore Academy also brought out a book. But I think it's uh, very, uh, it has not yet got into the popular uh, kind of imagination. Yeah, yeah. For example, Everybody holds C.V. Raman in great esteem, but he was the one who denied the women candidates in his lab. I mean, very few people would know about Kamala Sohani, who was, uh, had wanted to do research in Raman's lab. So there are, that's what I mentioned about hidden figures. So we, those stories need to be told. We need to know about Anna Mani. We need to know about so many other women. So some efforts are being made to correct that situation, and that's a long way, I would say. We really need to celebrate uh, all sides, and academy should uh, take it up in a big way because, unfortunately, on the outreach part, they lack. I mean, unlike Royal Society or you know, other academies which are forthright in coming up with new ideas and communicating with the society, ultimately, what is the use of an academy if you don't connect with the society? So that's the role I think uh, we need to emphasize, and some efforts are being made, but not to full extent, and of course, Museums are one place where a lot of people go from people from all walks of life. And I, I, as I, we were discussing that uh, Indian science museums and the science galleries are the sleeping giants. They get what I was shocked when I came to know that they get 15 million footfalls a year. And there are centers across India, even in smaller towns than are regional science centers and museums. Are. So those are the places where we need to highlight this information. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, yeah, he wants to. Yeah, please, please. Hello. Check. Okay. 
It seems as though there's a double di displacement, and this goes back to an earlier question. First, in India, the role of Indians at all being involved with any of this, and one important thing was even when the presidency universities were established, research didn't happen there. It was teaching, and the research really happened in other places like uh, the Industrial Institute, for example, or the Royal Institution in Bombay, and the like. It wasn't really happening here. So, and it's only with the zoological survey or the like that you actually get Indians involved, and this is a major difference between the early 20th century and much of the 19th century. The se so that is one, so that's a colonial moment. The second is the place of women even after men are involved. And the fact is women don't make it, right? Even this entire series that I spoke about, the fauna of British India, of the 33 author authors, two are Indian and both are male, right? And this will continue. I mean, right now we have what? Savitri Pithanaya writing on Janaki Amal, for example, and that's come through. Abbas Sur writes about the role of women in India. So this is, and, but again, look at these, these are women writing about women, right? And uh, I mean, if that's, if that's an indictment of us, <laughs> men, I don't know what they think. But I think it's, it's really important. They've got this double displacement moment, and I think it's something that needs to be recognized and taken head on. And the third, of course, is a question of even if Indian women, which women along caste lines, right? So there we are. Uh, we have a question from uh, Shub and then from Satyaji. Maybe we can collect both of them and then uh, have the uh, speakers respond. Uh, sure. Please, would you like to tell us your question first? Hello. Yeah, am I audible now? Uh, first of all, thank you, sir, for remembering my name. I did not uh, know that you weren't. Uh, this question is just generally about the speciality culture and how disciplines tend to be very rigidly separated in schools. And if you ever have ever like felt strongly about it, as in, do you think that at school level it can hinder a child's um, ability to think critically across uh, disciplines, or if it's okay at that level and it's okay that the we can catch up later on? Like because I do not. Uh, I, I felt like, you know, uh, that moment from Dr. Strange when I like came to, like, Ahmedabad University that forget everything you uh, know, uh, because, like, um, it's not inculcated in us to think about science from a historical perspective, to think about it from, like, an intersectional perspective. For example, Rosalind Franklin was never mentioned in school for us. And that, that is, like, really big, uh, like, emotionally also. So if you have ever felt like uh, at school level some interdisciplinary changes should be made and how they can be made in a way that uh, the curriculum is not getting increased and because I personally feel that it can be like we can start looking at science from the context uh, from the historical context because it's very important how ideas. Thank you so much. Could we just collect the next comment as well and then yeah. Uh, no, I just wanted to bring to your attention that there's this wonderful book by Mini Ved uh, called uh, the Wonderful Men and uh, Women in Their Flying Machines on oh. the women's role uh, in the mission to Mars and uh, the moon. I think uh, anyone who feels women have not found a place in writing about science should read that book. They are actually interview-based. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. May I take the question? Yes, please. Um, one of my favorite courses, admittedly this is in uni, in university, one of my favorite courses, I've just finished it this term, is called Science, History, and Theater. And what I do in this course is we read plays about science, including Galileo and Copenhagen and Einstein's gift. And, um, and it come, and the idea for the course, which I start in the States and have taught in at least three institutes now, comes from just the same kind of thinking. That why is it that we can't look at the social construction of, the, of what we deem science, and granted science in this case, from the point of view of the purveyors of it, right? Be it a physicist or a chemist or a biologist. It's also important to recognize that over the 20th century, the, the, num the number of journals that have existed, say, in the 19th century, have quadrupled and more, right? And the more, and if you're trying to cut up the pie, the answer is increasing specialization. Is that a good thing? 
one wonders, right? I mean, it's also true that since I was born, for example, the population of the world has doubled. Right? And so it's just, and that, and that. You had nothing to do with it. Yeah? That dates me, yeah, sure, but anyway, that's, but, I, but that's also important because you think, what then becomes a pie? What can you grow? And does that mean that we can't have a figure like Hodgson anymore? That we can't have Renaissance people, I mean, the best Renaissance. And I think there's a real loss over there. If the argument is going to be with an increasing number of students and relatively few places, that it's going to be someone who can score well on examinations and therefore you're going to need to silo. I think that's a really dismal view of the approach that we've taken. So hopefully, at, uh, I mean at least with liberal arts institutions as they are, there will be more crosstalk between disciplines and I for one would be delighted to see that happen. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just want to add to that the personal experience of um, when I studied engineering as an undergraduate, um, I absorbed about this much. And then later when I studied the work of engineers historically, um, I understood a little bit more. I still don't claim to understand engineering very much, but far more when I saw it through the stories of these people, the context from where they came, why they were doing what they were doing, and so on. So I absolutely agree. If we can have stories, we can have uh, uh, literature, we can have uh, even profiles of, of uh, individuals when we're studying their theories, right? So little things like that absolutely need to be done at school level. Thank you. Uh, do we, I think we are done. So thank you very much. It's been a wonderful audience. Thank you, Aparajit. Uh, just, just one uh, last point I want to make. Uh, I wanted very much to show you the covers of our uh, speakers' books. Uh, we couldn't, but the books themselves are available in the exhibition hall just outside. So please do, when you have time, go and have a look at them. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. We'd like to give some Thank you. mementos to the speakers, so please. Uh... Thank you so much, uh, from empires to languages, to archaeology, archives, uh, and science, there has to be some music, and that's what we're going to get to in about two minutes from now. Uh, after this session, there's also an interesting storytelling session, which we have uh, for you. Uh, so just give us one or two minutes, and we'll begin the next session.